Welcome and good morning, afternoon or evening to you all joining us from the United Kingdom, across Europe, the Middle East, Asia, Africa or wherever you are in the world. My name is Mary Ann Dutka and I'm the Product Marketing Coordinator at Sealight and I form part of our global marketing team. On behalf of Sealight, I wish to thank you for joining us today for our second webinar. Take the opportunity to sit back and relax for the next 45 minutes or so. This is webinar two of a five part series where we are bringing to you industry leading experts from across the globe. These industry experts will be sharing with you their knowledge and insights to assist you in the world of ATON and risk management. Our topic today is the practicalities of risk assessment and the IALA toolbox. I'm pleased to welcome Malcolm Nicholson, our Global Product Manager for Sealight. I'm even more excited to announce that we are in great company with Captain Roger Barker joining us from the United Kingdom. Roger is a leading industry expert on risk assessment and the former Director of Navigational Requirements at Trudney House. Roger is delivering to us an interactive presentation that will reference the IALA Marine ATOM Manual and the relevant standards, recommendations and guidelines. He will also step us through the fundamentals for assessing risk and the factors that we should consider. He will also apply the guidelines for us with examples that are relevant in the real world of ATON management. Before I pass over to Malcolm, I'll just go through some housekeeping for those that are not familiar with the Zoom platform. So firstly, you can view the speaker's video today under the view options tab uh, at the top of your screen. So also feel free to ask any questions during the webinar using the Q&A box, and you can access it from the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll hold any answering of questions until the end of the webinar presentation. I'll now pass you on to Malcolm, who will host today's webinar. We hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much, Mary Ann. And uh, I too would like to add my welcome and say hello and good day um, to all our wonderful attendees. It's so great to see so many familiar names uh, and those that aren't so familiar. I look forward to getting to know you. Um, <clears throat> it gives me great pleasure to introduce this is the second webinar in our series, the practicalities of risk assessment and the IALA toolbox. We've got three more to go, uh, one next month, which will give you the date and the speaker um, at the end of the presentation. Um, and then we'll be joined by uh, Francis Zachariah of Ayala for webinar four later on in December. And then we'll wrap it all up in, in early January, mid January with webinar five. What can I tell you about this gentleman on our screens here? Well, he's had a nearly 50 year odd career at sea, joining the Merch at, at 16 as a cadet. Um, and he did 24 years at sea before coming ashore as Marine Superintendent. Um, he's always been keen and very passionate about his job. I've known him for a long time and he is enjoying a well-earned retirement as he recently retired as Director of Navigation Requirements from Trinity House. And I shall hand over to you, Roger, and stop my dog barking. Thanks, Malcolm and Marianne, and good morning, evening, day, or whatever it is to all of you all over the world, which is uh, an absolute honour to be speaking to you this morning. Not sure about uh, the leading expert, but, uh, but I have my own um, uh, views and uh, and have worked in risk assessment and with IALA, an, an absolute pleasure for many years. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on the um, relevant um, uh, uh, tools, but I'll touch on them when where necessary, and particularly probably a bit of focus on IRAP and how I believe it can help you in the future. Nice photograph of Casket's Lighthouse there, and I just want to test if the uh, um, the mouse is working okay, Marianne. Okay. okay, so so as I've said there, um, and and I'm not going to read every slide, and you, thank goodness you won't have slides full of bullets. But uh, providing ace navigation is 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 a difficult business. But what we've got to do is make sure that those ace navigation we provide and the the appropriate risk mitigation measures are, as I've said, for today, not yesterday, not history. These are what we need to keep the mariners safe, and that is my passion. And to go on, I believe that the risk assessment, and I, I will mention it, no apologies for that, provides two things, not one. 
The risk assessment actually provides you with the information you need to make the decision, the right decision on the right day, but also in the future, it is the comprehensive record that you need to be able to refer back to when somebody's going to ask you, well, why did you send the ship at, uh, at, at a long distance at great cost? There is the answer. It's the comprehensive risk assessment. And I believe it's a fantastic tool. And when we're working together in the um, IALA risk management workshops, it is that message that we've got to get across. It's not here just for a, a tick box. It's there because it is a, a, the, the useful tool to make a record. So IALA SOLAS Chapter 5 Regulation 13, as far as uh, the ATON deployment it is where it begins. And of course, uh, we go forward and, and, and the important statement within SOLAS Chapter 5, of course, is that uh, contracting governments provide such aid to navigation as the volume of traffic, volume of justifies and the degree of risk requires. And that's where the risk assessment comes in. And of course, it's essential in the UK, and my apologies again, uh, much of my presentation will surround some of the new risks, particularly wind farms in our area, because it is creating significant increase in risk, and as such, we need to, to assess the requirements in the future. But it's essential that the aids navigation we provide are fully international. There's no good at all just having UK-centric solutions. They've got to be international, and that's where IALA come in, and the recommendations and guidelines, as laid down, are extremely important. So the ILA um, tools that uh, the ILA process now is with, with the, the headline standards through to the recommendations, the guidelines, and, and it is those guidelines that we write and continually amend to make sure that once again, they are appropriate for today. So the reference numbers that I will give you in the future uh, of, of the presentation on these guidelines, uh, they are actually under amendment now as we work in the current program of the ILA committees. Um, but they are there for reading as we are at the moment. So we have PAWS, the Qualitative Risk Assessment. It's an extensive tool and, and qualitative risk assessment um, uh, facility. What I want to say is that the importance of balancing the quantitative risk assessment against qualitative, stats cannot tell the picture wholly, but they will inform the, uh, inform the decision. But the quality development, that expertise is essential. IRAP, the International Waterways Risk Assessment Programme, is the quantitative tool that ILA provide. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but uh, uh, avoid trying to go into too much detail. If you want to learn about IRAP, attend the course because it will tell you the, the um, uh, absolute depths of, of what you need to know to use the tool. CIRA, we decided uh, was necessary as a, a more simplified qualitative risk assessment tool. POSA can take uh, two or, or perhaps more days with a, a large audience, a large gathered sector and, uh, of expertise. And sometimes you need something a little bit simpler and quicker. And the qualitative risk assessment process provided by CIRA can, in its place, be useful. And of course, to provide additional information feeding into that, it, qualitative risk assessment is simulation. It's an extremely good tool to evaluate the risks that might be evolving either existing or future risks in the future. So simulation is the, is the fourth tool. Now the risk reading education, of course, the, the headline recommendation uh, 1002 uh, and, and 1018, the headline risk document um, uh, guideline is, is the overarching document uh, uh, from IALA on, on the whole process, the whole toolbox. And then uh, guideline 1124 on uh, covering POSA, 1123 IRA, um, and uh, 1058 on um, uh, simulation. And of course, the um, manager training course, the level one ILA risk management tools is, is an essential element, which uh, I recommend attendance as you dig deeper into the whole process of risk assessment. Much of the work that we um, uh, do with IRAP is based on uh, imported AIS data, which forms a density plot. And there's an example of a density plot on the southeast, uh, southern North Sea, east coast of the UK, produced within IRAP there. But you'll see as I actually go through my slides that I um, also use a comprehensive GIS system. Sorry, my double click on there. Bit of lag there, Marianne. 
a, a comprehensive GIS system, and that is actually tracks incorporated into the GIS. And sometimes when I'm looking at spatial awareness or indeed traffic densities, we're not just looking at the, the pure density pot, but we're actually looking at where vessels go. So that combination of the feed in on the GIS into the qualitative and informing the quantitative risk assessment, I again believe is essential. Often it's about spatial awareness that we need to consider. Another example of the density plot and how we actually then develop legs within the density plot, and that's uh, those who know the area is the Straits of Hormuz, but just an example of the quite complicated build up using the IRAP tool and the skills required to actually develop the legs and, and process it, and indeed in the end identify increased areas of risk, so called hotspots. It's important to have the skills, but it's built on, uh, on the initial density plot and then uh, um, looking at legs, as you can see there. And I've talked a lot about the, um, the record of the risk assessment and out of the AIS data, a table is developed automatically showing the vessels involved. And that record, I think is essential. Having created the model within IRAP, you can actually make changes to, uh, uh, to routing measures or perhaps uh, improved aids navigation, which would better define the waterway, which then would change the risk. And you can make a comparison between uh, now and then. And that's where it really comes in. IRAP can be massively useful in saying, well, what if, and will it be useful in the risk assessment process? And the table is there for the future. Can be very complicated. That is the whole of the, the North Sea or Southern North Sea, showing the red areas, areas of increased risk and otherwise. But to get a, an overarching uh, feel for the risk area, it, it can be useful. But, but I, I feel in general, we use the tool when we're focusing more closely on particular areas and particular issues. That actually was a, a, a model developed for the AXIS programme some years ago. And I do apologise, the, uh, the click is, uh, is lagging a little bit to it between Australia and uh, here in Rowlands Castle, UK. Looking at the Southern North Sea and the, the density plot, a, a sample from what I showed you earlier, and you can see how I built the model looking at the legs, and I'm actually going to focus on a particular area there to use the example of a wind farm and how we compared risk from where it is today and where it might be in the future. Very, very useful to provide the backup. Now, Pausa, this is one of only two slides on the system because I suggest when we're going to use Pausa, go, go uh, attend the course, run uh, uh, and, and get more detail on how it works. But one of the important elements of Pausa is, is that book one, as they refer to there, which is established weighting factors. Because you've got to make sure that the appropriate weight is given to the expertise of the people attending the course. And, and also, you can find a situation where, where the louder voices may not necessarily be the voices that you need to hear assessing a particular risk. So that weighting is important right through the whole assessment of the model area. And uh, PAUSA uses the waterway risk assessment model covering many, many sectors uh, to assess the risk. And, and it is intrinsic examination of all those areas within the qualitative risk assessment, which is essential balanced against where appropriate a quantitative risk assessment. They sit hand in hand and it's essential that you do consider the both factors. And the, uh, the more simpler SIRA, uh, simplified uh, IL risk assessment tool um, and, and showing the product there, coming out with the uh, communicator result to the decision makers, the qualitative risk assessment, which can inform the decision and essentially make that record of the decision. I, in, in several times, have been asked many months in the future why we came to a particular decision, perhaps on a record change of an aid navigation. I can go straight to it because the records that we have on risk assessment is very useful. So let's, let's dig into the practicalities a little bit. And um, once again, sorry that uh, European centric and India UK, but that's where I work and that's what I do. And if we look at the... Um, the traffic over um, uh, over uh, 28 days, if it will work. You might say to me, well, what does that mean? Because we already know it's busy around the UK. Yeah, it is. That's just 28 days of traffic and it says it's busy. How does that inform the risk assessment? Well, actually, in truth, not a lot. But we've got to examine qualitatively and in the future quantitatively that risk and what it really means. If I take off 28 days and just look at one day, 
and I will add to it a green line, which is the 30 metre contour. And the red lines on the, the chart, as you can see there, are existing and proposed wind farm areas. Now, this is where it gets interesting. This is volume of traffic degree of risk. I would suggest that in 100 metres plus of water off Aberdeen, although there's a lot of traffic up there on the northeast coast of Scotland, the risk is fairly slim because of the depth of water that's involved, volume of traffic against degree of risk. Conversely, in the southern North Sea, where much of the, um, the depth of water is less than 30 metres, you can see the volume of traffic against the depth of water. If there was an incident in that, that area, or indeed shoals and banks to be considered, or indeed new or existing wind farms, then it's a different matter. At one glance, we've gone from 28 days, it didn't show us a lot, to a real assessment of volume of traffic against degree of risk is what it means. Because of the uh, size of data on the slides, I think it's taken a little while to come through, so I do apologise on that. But what we talk an awful lot about during the risk assessment is the requirement for spatial awareness. The spatial awareness, in many cases, comes from uh, now electronic charting information, but also the aids navigation, which provide uh, the essential physical reference. And that spatial awareness is both long range and close and short spatial awareness requirements. And and. On the GIS that we use all the time, I, um, I can incorporate the sectors and ranges of lighthouses. So you can start to get a feel for the offshore traffic and, and the degree of spatial awareness that the lighthouses provide. And, and then if we put on the positions of floating aids in the area, it becomes more complex, but also you can see how we're, uh, we're mitigating the risk as the vessels proceed through the heavily complex areas of the, the Thames approaches in the Southern North Sea. And we mitigate that by ace navigation, marking the dangers, providing appropriate spatial awareness. And then let's look at the traffic on top of it. Um, it's very slow, I'm sorry. Um, the wind farms first, increasing the, um, the uh, uh, factors that we have to consider when we're assessing the risk and, and it will change. And in fact, I'm gonna focus on a little area uh, on that area there now, but as risk changes, we need to reassess. And we can see Houston, we have a problem. It's pretty busy and we need to drill into that to have a, a close assessment of the um, of the risk and that's where the quantitative risk assessment and qualitative factors come come in where we measure the expertise against the identified hot spots and decide that we need to make a decision very very comprehensive and i i promote the use of all the ila tools to uh, to assess that risk and make your decision and direct that record now, I'm not going to read through the whole list, of, but there are many factors you must consider, both in quantification and qualitative measures. But general location, level of bridge awareness in the passage. Well, what does that mean? Well, there's a totally different situation when you've got a vessel on passage, small 1600 box boat, uh, sailing from, uh, from port to port, and he, he's on passage, third mate on the bridge on his own, and, uh, and um, he sh why should I have anything else? It's daytime passage, in other words. Is completely different to when you're making the close approaches to a busy traffic area or port where captain on the bridge, perhaps a pilot, hand steering, radars um, tuned up to the best effect, completely different situation. So when you're assessing the risk, you've actually got to look at what's really happening out there and the many other factors as well, including types of vessels, possibility of mechanical failure and, as I say, weather and uh, other traffic and, of course, uh, obstructions that may be around. Wind farms produce uh, some considerations with regard to radar and what you need to see in possible interference and indeed assess that when you're looking at the degree of risk and volume of traffic to see what additional marking might be required to mitigate the risk of a, uh, of a new um, development. And, and it, uh, the radar can be interfered with depending on the size of ship, position of radar scanners and the uh, external objects such as wind farm towers which, uh, uh, which must be considered. So 
Additionally, looking at the AIS traffic can be useful. This this was in it, it was actually um, uh, cancelled in the end, but it was a another wind farm, a, a large area proposed uh, wind farm uh, area in the uh, English Channel to the southwest of the Isle of Wight and Southampton. Why I put it on here is to demonstrate to you how useful different traffic patterns can be to inform your qualitative assessment. So first of all, I'll show you the AISA, in other words, the mandatory vessels who, who have to carry AIS. And I can balance that against leisure vessels that don't actually have to carry the AIS. So look at, look at the traffic there. And then if I give my next click and go to just AISB, you can see a completely different traffic patterns, particularly in the north of the area where you find the yachts really interesting when assessing the traffic and assessing the, the amount of uh, either changes or, or indeed uh, 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 inquisition we to, can make into the development of the, of the proposed offshore uh, wind farm in this case. That balance between AIS, A and B and, and demonstrating the figures was, was really useful. Um, <clears throat> I've said often during my presentation the importance of the record and the, the record that we produce out of that, that particular assessment down, down off the Isle of Wight was useful. I held that there, it sits in the database and we can use it for further reference in the future or indeed um, examining the decisions that we have to make. Spatial awareness doesn't just involve, um, of course, commercial vessels or indeed uh, uh, naval vessels. This is the ranges of some of the lighthouses in the Irish Sea with leisure tracks. They're not exact and defined tracks, but they give a measure of the density and, uh, and amount of leisure traffic in the area. And again, it's one of the considerations when you're looking at the requirement for spatial awareness. One to consider in that qualitative risk assessment, which can be informed by the quantification. Again, I apologise for the delay there. And that's uh, Start Point Lighthouse. Why have I put that up? Because it just gives me a chance to have a, a, a mouthful of water and make sure you're not getting bored. Beautiful lighthouse. Assessment of wrecks uh, can be different. And once again, it's the same thing. It's, what do we need to do? And, and unfortunately, we do get a lot of wrecks in the UK, often fishing vessels, sometimes leisure vessels, and sometimes uh, larger vessels than that. And what we've got to do is one thing for sure, when, when we're advised of a new wreck or, or, or danger, almost for certain, the first assessment or, or first announcement of that position will not be where it was originally advertised. But the first thing I'm going to do is have a look at the volume of traffic, who goes there, and we'll start to examine that degree of risk. And there it is. That is looking at a particular area in the uh, in the Southern North Sea, a lot of traffic. But where was the wreck? Well, is it there? Or, or there, or there, or there. What we're going to do is send a ship to search for it in the first place to have a look where it is. And, and once we know the defined position, then we can actually look at the traffic going over there. Because you can see the bubble on the left it, it, to the west of the area is, is quite different to the one, one in the middle in the high traffic density area where it's perhaps deeper draft vessels. It's essential that we examine and identify where it is, what the, uh, what the clearance depth of the top of it is, and we can start to make a decision. In one particular case, in, in a similar area to this one, not that exact area, and we looked and we found after the vessel had visited, the depth of water over the wreck was 5.1 meters, and we have a defined position. Then I can start to look at the risk assessment, and actually, what do I need to do? And how do I record that need to do that decision? This one was interesting with 5.1 meters. So uh, what did I do? Uh, we have a look at the, um, the, the uh, traffic volume going over the top of it. In the middle of the screen there, actually th this is the charted wreck with 5.1 meters, 28 days of traffic. That actually doesn't tell us, apart from it's busy, it doesn't tell me what I need to know. Is there a risk for 5.1 meters? But if I filter that down, to vessels only over four meters draft, four and a half meters draft, it becomes more informative. You can see at four and a half meters, i.e. just 60 centimeters um, um, less than the, the, defined, the danger of the wreck. Here we have a problem. I further looked and examined the, the depth of water over that particular wreck, looking at vessels over seven meters draft. And actually, there's no reason that some of those seven meter draft vessels couldn't have gone over the top of the wreck itself. There was no depth of water actually limiting the vessel there. That's just where the, the deeper draft vessels happened to be. So the risk was immense. And that 
quantitative and qualitative risk assessment in one assessment by looking at the, the depth of vessels, uh, drafts of vessels, etc., informed a decision. In fact, it told me I had to move pretty damned quick. And that's what we need to know. That is the record. And, and I'm, uh, from extracting the data and keeping on file is, is useful. And on that one, I had to use it time and again to demonstrate the, uh, the uh, decisions that we had to make. The record was actually removed. And, and it was for the valid reasons of the risk assessment. Very useful tools. Now, I've talked a little bit about IRAP and, um, and how it can be useful. Distribution curves actually produced by the IRAP model can, um, can be useful in actually assessing the change in risk. And this is just a schematic. This isn't anywhere in particular, but normal traffic on a leg, uh, northwest, southeast, would naturally keep to one side of the leg and keep away from the other vessels. The degree of, of interaction, head-on collision or crossing collision is fairly slim. But if we put two dangers, either side could be wind fan, could be banks, could be whatever. But you can see that then the, the compression of the traffic immediately means that there's an increase in risk. Quantification, we, we can actually look and assess what the changes are. And that's how we can use IRAP to inform the decision. And I'll go through a couple of, of, of examples, but not trying to go too much detail, attend the course to learn more about it. But here's some wind farm areas. And the proposal, the red one was a, a, a wider area, not to be developed completely in that area, but, but it was open to license. Basically, we're gonna to have to squeeze all the vessels through a much tighter gap. And we need to be able to tell the picture quantitatively and through the, the expert assessment as well, that we have a problem. So this area, here, when the machine behaves. Needs to be assessed and that area actually and, and over the chart I've overlaid the, the boundaries is, is in this area area here highlighted by the magenta circle. And basically, I want to know what the increase in risk would be if we had a development either side of a major traffic pattern. What tool can we use? Well, I suggest IRAP can be useful. So this goes back to the density plot I showed you earlier with the legs that we put on, and in fact, focusing on the, um, on the area of interest, which is that one. And it's where IRAP comes into it, really comes into its own, um, to be able to assess and, uh, and quantify that risk. The distribution curve produced with the automatically imported AIS data looks something like that. Wind fan to the north and southwest, and, and the traffic patterns, and you can see that it's fairly good. There's uh, the uh, westbound traffic, it not interacting with the east and southeast bound traffic, it's fairly clear. But what would be the difference if we built wind farms and we had to squeeze everybody through this tight line here? Yeah, we, uh, we really have a problem that we need to assess. And the tool we're using, IRAP, can help in informing that decision, which will then look at mitigation measures. And the record of the vessels involved is, uh, is, is there for use in the future. So what I've done then is with the distribution curves showing what the difference is, because, of course, you, you, you can see in that, uh, in, in that uh, schematic how the, the interaction between vessels head on and, of, of course, crossing situations would be huge, without a doubt. And we can prove it through the model. And look at the increase in risk on that particular area. Now, th this was actually an, uh, an example of where it went and things changed as we developed in the future. But it's a powerful statement there. 139% increase in risk. Minister, we have a problem. And indeed we did. And um, uh, the wind farms uh, were not developed exactly in there. It was pushed further north to keep away from the tight transit area. Some of it built on that increase in risk, volume of traffic, degree of risk, Solace chapter five. Very, very useful information. And I use another example because it went the other way, this one. This was a proposed wind farm on the West Coast in the, um, in, in the Irish Sea. I'm looking at, uh, there were some proposals actually to put a traffic separation scheme in where the, um, where the blue circle is. And what we looked at, again, using IROP was actually that to put a separation scheme in there, although it would separate the end on traffic, reduce head on collision risk, that risk actually was already fairly low. How do we know? Because we used IRAP to tell us. And that's the distribution curve produced automatically through the IRAP tool. Now, what we could assess is actually changing from a distribution curve like that to separating the traffic as in the, um, the uh, um, data within the IRAP tool would, although it would separate the end on traffic, 
the increase in risk due to overtaking would increase. And in fact, it, the, the benefit overall was, uh, uh, it was zero. And in fact, uh, the increase in overtaking risk was uh, outweighed the, the benefits. And I'm going to touch right at the end of this presentation on, the, uh, on the, uh, overtaking risk because it's increasing. Many vessels are now plotting the same red line on the same electronic chart and following the same route. And sadly, not always keeping the level of bridge look out the window awareness. So overtaking risk is increasing because vessels are following the same route. And I'll prove that through a, a, a clip I'll show you very shortly. So there we go. That was the, the outcome, a tool that helped us make that decision. So back to Dover Strait and interesting because a lot of people have been talking to us about the, um, uh, about the size of the separation uh, or, or the traffic lane to the north of the Van Bank, north of this bank here, coming through here. Could the lane be made wider? Could it be reduced or what, uh, or whatever, to, to actually assist in the traffic flows through there or, or changes in the, um, in the air to navigation marking to improve the risk? And in fact, we did make changes there on the back of the risk assessment. However, the question could be asked as to, should we change the width of that lane? And the machine will come up with the, the graphic. And what I would say is, well, I'm not sure, but I know a tool that would be able to tell me what the risk is with it like there, and what would it be if we changed it? That tool can be IRAP. Serious use of the quantitative risk assessment, not forgetting the expertise, the qualitative assessment, what vessels are actually going through there. Really useful stuff. So I've gone on an awful lot about the benefits of quantitative risk assessment in hand with the expertise coming through the qualitative assessment and they cannot stand alone. They need to work together hand in hand and, and the tools are there to, to make those assessments and record the decision. So what I'd like to do, the, um, the IRAP um, tool also has a replay facility, which, which can be very useful both in building the legs and deciding legs, but also having a more general look at the, uh, uh, at the tool. And I'll show you that right at the end. Before we actually close on the, on the wider risk assessment, we, we, we must consider other considerations. And this is one that I'm sure you, those who are working risk are, are very aware of, but we, we must remember that not all traffic uh, is required to carry the, the AIS transceiver unit. And as such, we must remember when we're assessing a particular area through the expertise and quality of assessment to make sure that all vessels are considered. Causation factors actually uh, used within the uh, IRAP tool uh, can be changed, that is risk reduction factors and uh, the expertise required to actually apply the causation factors needs assessing. And as such, the skills required in developing the model are, are essential. You can't really go into IRAP blind, it, you need to know how you develop those legs. But in the end, as I've explained for many, many examples where it can prove very, very useful. And the quality of element local knowledge is essential. Thank you. So if this clip works, Marianne, I hope. So we're going to focus here in ju just, it's a short repair clip, but see the, the two vessels uh, in the middle there are actually fishing vessels going the wrong way, going northeast on the southwest bound lane. First of all, I'll ask all you mariners in, in, in the room today. How many times have you altered course for a fishing vessel and just after you've altered course it's turned around and gone the other way? Probably you will say more times than not and, and that actually is a fact. It's useful. But here they were going the wrong way. Um, we we're looking actually at the, the possibility of automating some of the, uh, or if some of the ferries crossing from, um, from Dover across to the French side Calais and uh, um, it's interesting. What, how the, um, the algorithms on the autonomous ship would work. And, and of course, uh, it, it can work and machine learning can work in the future, but lots of considerations. But if I show you the clip, just as an example to see, see how you can use the IRAP tool, it becomes very useful. It's um, because of the, um, uh, the, the, the time lag between Australia and UK, it, it's ra rather slow. So I'm not gonna, it, it's not working anything like it would normally. But you see the two fellows uh, operating going up here. Um, you can actually see that the way they'll turn around. Now, looking at qualitative risk assessment areas where fishing vessels operate, this can be useful. I just, if I can, wanted to point out 
Okay, look at the vessels. This is a totally different subject. The vessels going southwest in that lane, all following exactly the same track. So that's what I said earlier that the um, increase in risk due to overtaking, it, it is changing. Bridge practices and uh, bridge team management and, and operation of the vessel is changing. And there is a, a fairly high reliance on uh, electronic position information and indeed digital track information. And as such, vessels are tending to follow the same red lines and overtaking is increasing. So when you're making those risk assessments, I suggest that we've, uh, we've got to make uh, careful consideration. And that's about it. I think I've, um, I've, I've explained right through how the ILR toolbox can be useful in, the, uh, in, in assessment of the risk, informing the decisions, but also in recording the tool. Thanks very much. Hope that was useful. So, back to Malcolm. Thanks very much, Roger. Um, we'll thank you very much for a very, very interesting presentation. Um, please feel free to submit your questions and answers. Um, while people are doing that, um, I've got a question myself, actually. Um, if someone from our attendees, and, and just to let you know now, Roger, we've had over 70. I didn't want to tell you at the beginning, but we've had over 70 attendees. Um, but if, if someone was interested in setting up um, an IRAP uh, um, risk assessment, what, what would be the minimum requirements? What would they need? What, what do they need to go about building the system so they can perform IRAP risk assessments? What you need to do is go back to IALA and, and, the, and the, best, the best answer is if you've got no expertise in using the tool, attend one of the risk assessment toolbox uh, talks, so the risk assessment uh, workshop. Because the uh, using the tool, it's essential to um, to have the expertise but then the, the, there are two versions of IRAP there is a free version but the um, and the the uh, commercial version has the ability to import AIS data automatically into the system and to make the tool work properly you need AIS data so you need the expertise and you can really only get that through um, you know, through going on the course and learning how to use the tool and um, and and I would say that if at all possible you need data to make the tool work so you need an AIS data feed for the areas that you're considering covering. Um, you need some software and you need to go on the IALA risk assessment course, which leads me quite nicely into a question from Kevin, our good friend, Kevin Gregory. I'm sure he's very happy about us mentioning going to the academy to do the course. Um, but what he's asking is what can you say about the possible implications for coastal state if they choose not to implement a robust risk assessment in their area of responsibility? That's a good question from Kevin. No, no surprises there. I, I would say that to make a decision which isn't informed and, and then, as I've said several times within my presentation, to make that decision and have no record of the decision would, would I believe, be uh, towards full hardy. You must be able to assess both spatial awareness, requirements for those aids navigation. And, and one of the problems is that, that many of our areas, <coughs> we've had navigation there for many years. We must make sure that we assess for the future. So I would say that, uh, that the, to carry out an appropriate risk assessment is an essential element in assessing Chapter 5, Regulation 13, the fact that contracting governments have appropriate areas of navigation according to volume of traffic against degree of risk. Fantastic. And I suppose that really, as a, as a follow-up question, it comes from Anonymous, um, and thanking you for a fantastic presentation. Um, what's your top three risk factors that you've seen over your illustrious career and have these changed or increased with the adoption of digitization of the bridge? The, um, I, I suppose the, 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 the top two risk factors, I'd, I'd rather say, um, are uh, uh, the change in bridge practices. There is a heavy reliance on uh, electronic information, which can be very useful. 
However, it, it can, when used without full consideration, can be dangerous. And I, I've mentioned the fact that, that many vessels are following the same red lines through a, a traffic area. And, and unless you actually ensure that that red line is appropriate for your vessel, and, and, and that use of electronic information can be as bad as developing a, a passage for a vessel with, what should we say, six or eight metres draft, and then using the same passage on a 12 or 15 metre draft vessel. So the, the use of electronic information is an increasing risk factor. However, the other one, which is hand in hand with that, is that our sea space is becoming more compressed for many reasons. And one of them is offshore developments, which I've focused on around the UK today. So we must make sure that, that as we consider these new developments, we, we assess the risk and, uh, and work together hand in hand. We, we, uh, it might be seen that I, I've complained a little bit about wind farms. That, that's not the case. We all want our grandchildren to be able to turn the lights on in the future. And we need the wind farms. We need the other uses or other energy resources. But we've got to sit hand in hand with mar the marine transport issues. Um, so those are my two risks, I would say. That's great. <clears throat> um, Geraldine's asking if we can use satellite data for an IRAP session. <laughs> that, Geraldine, that's um, a... Uh, yeah. A good question. Not surprised it come from you, and it, it, it gives me a chance to to speak again on that whole issue. Satellite data is great, but one of the, one of the problems is that the hits between um, uh, satellite passes can be up to six hours. So if you imagine a ship crossing the um, uh, crossing the Dover Strait and it does it in about an hour and a half, does it three or four times in six hours? Unfortunately, that. Uh, that satellite data is not appropriate for the, the real traffic pattern. But to get a, a wider, uh, what should we say, um, uh, vessel traffic distribution curve, you can get an idea of where the heavier traffic densities are. But then when we drill into the, the where the vessels are actually going, um, point to point, you need something, a better definition than what most of the um, satellite data can give at the moment. But it is improving, Geraldine, as you know, so uh, watch the space. Now we've got a couple of questions with, with sli not, not slightly off topic, but it is um, a topic of the moment with regards to mass. And uh, would, you, would you care to comment on the uh, trend of autonomous shipping in terms of risk? Yeah, love it. I love the subject. I'm engaging in UK um, and uh, the, the algorithms and the machine le learning that can come out of the autonomous vessels are fantastic. So what I believe for, uh, for our end of the shop um, decision support mechanisms which will come out of the autonomous technology are fantastic and indeed I believe that the for example the lighthouse tender vessels the GLA vessels in UK in the future will use facilities for gathering uh, multi-beam survey data autonomously each vessel may have an array of autonomous gadgets for want of a better word to collect uh, multi-beam data and on long passages from Panama to New Zealand, which was my first trip as a 16 year old boy, and we didn't see anybody day by day. The, the use of autonomous systems actually to provide levels of support to avoid danger of, of boredom, uh, perhaps in that sort of a passage, they will come in. Will we have autonomous vessels on high density traffic areas? Will, will the tankers of the future passing through Dover Strait run right through Dover Strait to fully autonomous? I don't know. I don't, there's a lot to go, but, but what I do know, we've got a, the, the, the technology is fantastic in the right hands. We, uh, and, and the balance between where it can be used uh, and not is, is one we've got to follow up. But, uh, but those decision support mechanisms coming out of the technology are fantastic. They will be able to inform better or improved operation of the ship. Whether it's fully autonomous or remotely operated is a different question, but let's work with the technology guys, the experts, and make sure we take the best advantage of the technology. Mm. Yeah, and we have, um, I think we've got time for one or two more questions. We've got a question here from Gillian from Northern Lighthouse Board. How do you see Aton provision altering to support autonomous vessels? That's a good question, Gillian. Uh, uh, nice to hear from you. Um, I think that uh, the digitization of ATONS uh, will, uh, and, and the information that can be provided digitally back between uh, the autonomous ship and the algorithms there and back to, to the position reference and will improve and uh, also will, we will take advantage of it. 
but, but equally, I, I think that we have to remain aware that, that many vessels, for example, if I uh, quote I often use, is that egg discharge requirements end at 10,000 gross tons. Existing cargo vessels less than 10,000 gross tons don't have to carry an ECDIS. Now, to be able to display electronic charted information um, uh, uh, and you don't have an ECDIS is very difficult. Of, of course, an autonomous vessel isn't, isn't looking at his chart, he's looking at, uh, at position referencing and improvements and, and, and digitization. Um, smart atons will come into the future to support the uh, the, the uh, unmanned or remotely operated vessels and their uh, reference to to a um, an aid navigation on the surface. And so, I, I'd say that uh, that we will change, we will evolve, but we will also recognise that we provide ace navigation for all mariners from the, the windsurfer to the, the very largest container or, or the vessel or, or tankers. And we will measure that as we develop the ace navigation technology. Mm. I guess that would require and demand a great deal of standardisation as far as things like transmission protocols and acceptance. And, and yeah. I guess... Um, perhaps even following the S100 model of, of having it open source, but there's always a balance between having open source platform and then cybersecurity risk. Yeah, that, that, that's right. It, 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 the cyber is an issue. And, and, but, but, but having said that, I think that uh, um, commonality for all systems use, using, as you say, using the S100, the, uh, the, the, the data models is, uh, is, is absolutely essential to make sure that we're all using exactly the same, same hymn sheet. And that, of course, then that will pass through to VTS, charting, hydrographic offices, so that we, we ensure we're all using the same data. The, the only problem is it gets almost back to uh, the current requirements. As I just said, Malcolm, the, uh, that, that figure I quoted on um, uh, 10,000 gross tonnes. 74% of the UK registered fleet is less than 10,000 gross tonnes. So we always have to remember that uh, it, it is all mariners and we must try and improve the, the level of, um, of knowledge of, uh, as to what the mariners out there are actually having. And, and it may be that there are changes as we develop into the future with carriage requirements. Fantastic. Well, I think that's about all we've got time for. Um, so if Mary Ann, if you'd like to, you're in control. So if you, there we go. Um, <clears throat> so thanks for attending this. Um, I'm really excited to announce our next webinar is going to be on December the 3rd, 2020. Um, and we're going to have Dave Leewald, who Roger knows very well from the US Coast Guard. Um, and he'll be presenting about eight on systems and maintaining those systems. So off the back of risk assessment, it leads nicely into the actual eight on systems and how you go about providing the networks and how you go about maintaining them. Um, so I do hope you'll all be able to join us for that. Um, and with that, I'd like to say thank you very much to Roger and thank you very much to Mary Ann. Um, and if you wouldn't mind those, those participants who have all stayed on to the end, if you wouldn't mind taking part in a quick 60 second survey at the conclusion, um, we hope that you've enjoyed today. We hope you've found it informative and we look forward to seeing you next time. So thank you very much. Thank you.